Should we start, Dan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so welcome everybody to the second of the uh, Raven Room Society Centenary Lecture Series, following on from uh, last week's talk by Lindsay Hanley. Um, I'm Eleanor Taylor, I'm a member of the Executive Committee of the Society, um, and I'm very pleased to welcome um, Daniel Hartley, who's going to give tonight's talk. Daniel is Assistant Professor in World Literature at Durham University. Um, his, his research focuses on literary style, world literature, and the historical sociology of modernity. His first book, The Politics of Style, Towards a Marxist Poetics, developed a systematic theory of literary style through an imminent critique of the work of Raymond Williams, Terry Eagleton, and Frederick Jameson. Um, he's also refined this work in um, a number of um, articles on the topic of style and Marxist um, theory and poetics. He's also somebody who's worked a lot with Williams and Williams's legacies, uh, reading Williams's work from the late 70s and from the 1970s in particular, as a complement and challenge to prevailing materialist approaches to world literature. In a recent article, Dan has argued that Williams's writings on Wales, nationalism, modernism, the classics, writing and orality, not to mention his cultural materials methodology more generally, offer a powerful anti-imperial conception of literacy and a novel understanding of universality, intellectuality and education. In 2022, he's going to be editing a special issue of uh, the Raymond Williams Society Journal, Keywords, um, on the topic of Raymond Williams and world literature. And he's just um, embarking on a new book project, provisionally entitled Peasant Modernism, the Cultural Logic of Post-Capitalism. So Dan's going to talk for about an hour, I think, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, if I can just ask you all to make sure your mics are muted um, while Dan's speaking, that would be great. Okay, over to you, Dan. I will stop sharing this now. Cheers. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll just start sharing my screen. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks very much. So first of all, I just want to thank uh, the Raymond Williams Society very much for their kind invitation and thanks to Phil and Eleanor um, in particular. Uh, it's a real kind of honour to be asked to speak as part of this series celebrating the life and thought um, of Raymond Williams. And I'd like to thank everyone for, for coming to this talk this evening. Williams's ideas and his contempt for the ruling class continue in many ways to sustain me personally, even perhaps especially in moments of personal crisis. And in fact, Williams was in many ways one of the great theoreticians of crisis, of those moments of breakdown and decision which occur in any life, when you must decide not only what you live for, but also the ideas, feelings, relationships, and resources that you can or cannot live from. There are ideas and ways of thinking, Williams famously wrote, with the seeds of life in them. And there are others, perhaps deep in our minds, that contain the seeds of a general death. When he returned from the war to Cambridge, one of his earliest um, which was one of his earliest periods of personal crisis. He worked obsessively on a thesis on Ibsen, in whose work he located a structure of feeling that was his own in that period, and which would prevent him from taking the rightward turn that many of his erstwhile comrades of the 1930s would subsequently perform. Although everybody is defeated in his work, he told the NLR interviewers in 1979, the defeat never cancels the validity of the impulse that moved him. And yet that the defeat has occurred is also crucial. So you can see that even in this relatively early period of, of personal crisis, um, there's a certain type of connection between his thinking and that, and that period. So what I'm gonna try and do in my talk this evening is, I want to take philosophically seriously the frequency with which Williams's theoretical insights emerge from moments or durations of crisis, both personal and social. And in particular, I want to consider the connection of crisis and method in Williams's writings on culture. And the talk is going to consist, broadly speaking, of three parts with, prior to that, a brief introduction. The first part um, will trace three key instances of this connection between crisis and culture, or crisis as a mode of thinking culture. First of all, by looking at his attempt to go beyond Leavis's conception of culture, then his writings on the relationship between class and education in Thomas Hardy, and finally, his late studies of Welsh national culture. And what I want to draw attention to there um, is that each of these conceptions are characterized by figures of rupture, breaks, or discontinuities in experience, history, and form that are formalizations of crises, both personal and social. 
In the second part, I then want to try and extrapolate from those instances a characteristic critical method that Williams uses repeatedly across all domains of his work. One that's tied to the phrase that he inherited from T.S. Eliot, culture is a whole way of life, and that entails reinstating the true social complexity that selective traditions tend to erase. And I'll then conclude by suggesting that there are two key instances of contemporary politics that invite us both to test and to extend Williams's method and his theory of culture more broadly. And those are the so-called Green New Deal and repeasantization struggles across the world. And crucially, these two movements bring back with a vengeance many of the issues um, and pitfalls that Williams spent much of his life thinking and working through. So I'll begin with this idea of culture and breaks, which is effectively partly a reminder and partly a mild provocation. This is just to kind of set up what, what follows. Firstly, there's a kind of a reminder about the keyword culture. So as all readers of Williams will know, the keyword culture contains within itself the history of capitalist modernity and not least the strange fate of modernity's relationship to agriculture. Originally denoting the tending of something, basically crops or animals, during the 16th century, the word culture came to mean a process of human development. Thus, Francis Bacon could write of the culture and manurance of minds in what Terry Eagleton has called a suggestive hesitancy between dung and mental distinction. A cognate of civilization, culture came ultimately to mean three things, all of which are distant from the land. Firstly, a process of intellectual, spiritual, and aesthetic development. Secondly, a particular way of life. And thirdly, the works and practices of intellectual and especially artistic activity. And the task is then to think culture in its historically recent sense of a way of life or a set of artistic activities, whilst never losing sight of its etymological roots in the soil. And that was effectively the task that Williams set himself. And at the end of this talk, what I want to suggest is that as contemporary representation struggles in particular, i.e. the proactive choice to return to the land and peasant agriculture as a solution to the multiple contradictions of capitalism, that this constitutes the next historical stage in the trajectory of this keyword. So that's the reminder on culture and the keyword culture and, and the basic trajectory of that word. And now I want to propose a kind of a, a very mild, mainly academic provocation that will inform the readings that follow. I want to suggest that an attentiveness to the language of crisis in Williams's theoretical work brings to light affinities that Williams shares with the Althusserian tradition, to which she is normally said to be diametrically opposed. There's a fairly lazy shorthand that usually gets rolled out, which is structuralist Marxism versus socialist humanism. Both Williams and the Althusserians could perhaps more productively be seen as distinct but related inheritors of a much longer tradition of materialist thought and particularly of materialist reading, um, dating back at least as far as uh, Spinoza, um, if not further, passing through Hegel and coming into its own with Marx and in a different way, Freud. And two key aspects of this line of thought have been articulated by Bruno Bastille's and Warren Montag respectively. And I just want to look at these quotations as a kind of way of framing how I'm going to be reading certain passages of, of, of Williams's thought on culture. The first is from Bastille's book, Marx and Fraud in Latin America. Marxism and psychoanalysis link a category of truth onto a delinking, an unbinding, or a coming apart of the social bond in moments of acute crisis. Truth here is tied to a certain experience of the real that interrupts and breaks with the normal course of things. More so than as positive sciences or as philosophical worldviews, therefore, the discourses of Marx and Freud are better seen as doctrines of the intervening subject. Now, what I'm not suggesting is that Williams's work is a kind of a carbon copy of this logic of the intervening subject, which is self-evidently more suited uh, to the philosophy of someone like Badiou, whom Bastille has also written on, but also of, of Althusser. But I nonetheless want to stress um, that the emphasis on the temporary break of the social bond in moments of crisis 
and the break with the normal course of things is, as we shall see, crucial to Williams's project of critique and his theory of culture. And likewise, just as a brief aside, the rejection of the view of Marxism and psychoanalysis as positive sciences is echoed in Williams's little known but fascinating essay on David Hume, which you can find in Writing in Society, which elaborates something like a materialist protocol for the critical reading of philosophical texts, one that's alert not only to their headline propositions and theses, but to their stylistic hesitations, to their social tonalities, and the symptomatic shifts in modes of presentation. The substantial truth of a philosophy for Williams cannot be reduced to its formal thetic logic. And indeed, this, this kind of practice of reading then feeds into another similarity um, in the next quotation. And this is Warren Montag talking about the inheritance from Hegel um, in Baliba and Mashere. And he writes, we could summarize this inheritance from Hegel as the notion that these texts are intelligible, that is become the objects of an adequate knowledge only on the basis of contradictions that may be understood as their imminent cause. So in other words, what this mode of reading shared by Balibar and Machere, and I would argue partly by Williams as well, what, what they have in common is the idea that texts are constituted by contradictions that are their imminent cause. And the task of the critic will then be to identify and explain these contradictions. So there's a conception of text here um, as not as unified and self-contained, but as internally divided or disordered. And this will then be crucial for Williams's history of the English novel, not least in its systematic divergence from Leibniz's organicism as uh, set out in Leibniz's great tradition. And it was partly against that book that Williams wrote his own. So those are a couple of kind of framing ideas for, for, for the things that follow. And I'm now going to move on to that first part of the talk where we'll look at three examples of the way in which crisis and culture are connected in Williams's thought. And incidentally, one could have chosen many more. I've just chosen these three because I think they're the most kind of archetypal. The first um, involves, I'll, actually, I'll come back to that. The first involves Williams's attempt to move beyond Leibniz's conception of culture. Now, whenever Williams discusses the word culture, the word crisis is never far behind. In Culture is Ordinary, published in 1958, he remarks of what he calls Leibniz's uh, version of what is wrong with English culture, that he was, and I quote, deeply impressed by it, deeply enough for my ultimate rejection of it to be a personal crisis lasting several years. So that's a kind of a profound influence that Leibniz's ideas have had on him. And this period of, of crisis presumably coincided with that following the collapse of the short-lived journal Politics and Letters that Williams had co-edited with Wolf Mankiewicz and Clifford Collins from 1947 to 8, of which Williams later said, at that point, apart from going on with the actual adult education teaching, I felt I could only write myself out of this in a non-collaborative way. I pulled back to do my own work. For the next 10 years, I wrote in nearly complete isolation. So there's a certain type of kind of asociality that's involved in this, non-collaborative, I pulled back in nearly complete isolation. Now, what exactly was Leibniz's view that it took a decade for Williams to work through alone? In The Country and the City, yet another book that arose out of what Williams calls the local forms of a particular and personal crisis, Williams summarizes Leibniz's view thus. That very powerful myth of modern England, in which the transition from a rural to an industrial society is seen as a kind of fall, the true cause and origin of our social suffering disorder. It is difficult to overestimate the importance of this myth in modern social thought. It is a main source for the structure of feeling which we began by examining, the perpetual retrospect to an organic or natural society. But it is also a main source for that last protecting illusion in the crisis of our own time. Namely, that it is not capitalism which is injuring us, but the more isolable, more evident system of urban industrialism. So this idea of the kind of the retrospectively posited organic community, that at some time there was a prelapsarian kind of Edenic vision uh, of social relations and their relationship to nature that has now fallen 
with industrial modernity, but which excises all critique of capitalism and capitalist social relations. It was this vision that Williams tried to move beyond. And what Williams has effectively achieved here is an articulation in both senses of the word between his own personal crisis and the general social crisis of the time, each of which involved complex questions of class, place, ecology, and education that the selective traditions available to him were inadequate to resolve. Williams's withdrawal from writerly sociality in this period suggests a connection with what Bostils called in, in the quotation we looked at earlier, a coming apart of the social bond in moments of acute crisis. And it's this critical negativity that constituted the ground of Williams's theoretical elaboration of culture. Now this becomes clearer in Williams's retrospective return to the keyword culture in Marxism and literature. And indeed the reflections included there on the process that led to his critical reconfiguration of that word are, I would argue, of the utmost philosophical importance. Um, and I talk a bit about this uh, at, at a certain point in the book, The Politics of Style. Um, I want to give it a slightly different emphasis today. And what I'm going to do now is quote at some length this key passage, because I think it's, it's really important, uh, this passage on culture. At the very center of a major area of modern thought and practice, which it is habitually used to describe, is a concept, culture, which in itself, through variation and complication, embodies not only the issues, but the contradictions through which it has developed. The concept at once fuses and confuses the radically different experiences and tendencies of its formation. It is then impossible to carry through any serious cultural analysis without reaching towards a consciousness of the concept itself, a consciousness that must be historical. This hesitation before what seems the richness of developed theory and the fullness of achieved practice has the awkwardness even the gaucherie of any radical doubt. It is literally a moment of crisis, a jolt in experience, a break in the sense of history, forcing us back from so much that seemed positive and available, all the ready insertions into a crucial argument, all the accessible entries into immediate practice. Yet the insight cannot be sealed over. When the most basic conceptions, the concepts, as it is said, from which we begin, are suddenly seen to be not concepts, but problems, not analytic problems either, but historical movements that are still unresolved. There is no sense in listening to their sonorous summons or their resounding clash. We have only, if we can, to recover the substance from which their forms were cast. Now, I've quoted that at such a length because I think it's absolutely crucial and contains uh, kind of the core elements of not only Williams' conception of culture, but what led to that conception, and also an implicit series of theoretical and philosophical positions that I want now to try and tease out. Now, the first thing to note is that concepts such as culture play a constitutive part in the practices they were thought merely to describe, right? So that's, that's part of the logic of, um, of keywords, right? That's one of the, the, the main definitions of a keyword is that they play a part in the problems they were thought to describe. It's not just that they delimit a certain area of society, which is itself a deeply problematic word, or a certain set of practices within it, but that they internally inform the nature and self-understanding of the practices and those who practice them. And moreover, because concepts embody the contradictions through which they have developed, as we saw earlier with the concept of culture, their internal incoherence is not analytical or theoretical, but a residue of past and ongoing practical struggles. So in other words, you can't resolve the, the social and, and cultural contradictions that are contained in, in concepts just by listing so many different dictionary definitions. Cultural analysis, which ignores the complex and contradictory histories of these words, i.e. which fails to raise itself to historical consciousness, is thus inadequate. And what is required is radical doubt, a term whose Cartesian pedigree can perhaps be glimpsed in such passages. So I don't think that's a phrase that's used coincidentally, radical doubt. It is a force imminent to the situation which can overcome all that seems positive and available. 
Central words like culture and society, because they are used so often and so confidently, tend to become automated, such that we use them without having submitted them to critical scrutiny. And in doing so, it's the words themselves which do our thinking for us and consequently perpetuate our current practices. Now, in such a context, radical doubt is a moment of determinate or absolute skepticism, which opposes to all that is positive and available, a critical ne negativity that Williams describes as literally a moment of crisis. So what is happening here? What is happening, I think, is that the, the automatic social bond is temporarily jolted. The sense of history in both senses of meaning and direction, the sense of history is suddenly broken. The teleology of everyday life is ruptured and newly lived by the critical subject as a disoriented and mooring from the symbolic order. Where T.S. Eliot's notion of tradition was bound up with a historical sense, so in other words, I'm suggesting that there's a connection between what Williams is calling here, the sense of history, and the phrase historical sense, which is crucial in Eliot's essay, Tradition and Individual Talent. Where Eliot's notion of tradition was bound up with a historical sense, capable of suturing the present to the timeless order of the European past, Williams's materialist critique is located in the breach of order's conceptual guardians. When using words such as culture and society as they seem to wish us to use them, we unconsciously engage in pre-critical philosophy since we haven't rationally deduced their a prioriticity in kind of Kantian terms. And yet any serious analysis of these terms will soon find that they are, quote, not concepts but problems, and not analytic problems either, but historical problems that are still unresolved. Thus what had initially appeared as unproblematic concepts which transcended the reality they were presupposed to describe, when submitted to radical doubt and critical negativity, become problems in their own right. But they're not analytical problems because they're part of social and historical con contradictions. And these can only be resolved socially and historically. And yet this isn't a sacrifice of theory or conceptual thought. It's not some kind of pure um, uh, reductive pragmatism. On the contrary, because these concepts are constitutive factors, in the historical process, a conceptualization of the contradictions they contain will be a necessary part of any practical intervention into those struggles. So theory and practice are not opposed to it, but become two modes of the same historical substance. So all of that is to say that the first imminent connection between crisis and culture in Williams's work is that crisis seems to be based on this passage, crisis is the experiential precondition for a critical materialist account of culture. So that's the first, ex the first kind of the long example of the connection between crisis and culture. Crisis is an experiential precondition for a critical materialist account of culture. And I'm now gonna look at two slightly shorter um, examples of crisis and culture. The first relates to what Williams wrote about Hardy's style. And I have to admit that Williams's writing on Hardy's style had become something like a primal scene for me. I seem to find myself constantly, almost obsessively returning to these analyses because they still seem to contain so many contemporary contradictions to do with language, class, accent, um, belonging, and so on and so forth. I think they're just, they're, they remain incredibly rich. So what is, what is going on with Hardy's style? In 1892, the critic William Watson, echoing countless similar reviews, criticized Hardy's what he called over-academic phraseology, noting that it was what he described as exceptional and excrescent and serves no purpose but to impair the homogeneity of his utterance. So there is a certain kind of set of internal discontinuities and, and, and ruptures in Hardy's style. And F.R. Levis clearly agreed when he wrote off Hardy in the great tradition simply by quoting Henry James's condescending phrase, the good little Thomas Hardy has scored a great success with Tessa the D'Urbervilles, which is chock full of faults and falsity and yet has a singular charm. Now Levis's principle of canonical selection um, in the great tradition was premised upon a connection between form and morality, 
formal failure is always a symptom of moral failure, a lack of maturity or falling short of the impersonal poise that was Leibniz's sine qua non of aesthetic success. And it's thus no surprise that the constitutive stylistic unevenness of Hardy's prose can be written off so easily. But against this view, Williams, like Marx and Freud before him, I would argue, is drawn precisely to those elements of what he calls disturbance in the history of the English novel and of English prose. And these are namely linguistic and formal fissures or ruptures that are symptoms of crisis and historicity, or rather crisis as historicity. So let's look at this quotation from um, uh, an essay that, that Williams wrote on, on English prose. Hardy as a writer was mainly concerned with the interaction between the two conditions that Thomas Hardy um, had experience of, the educated and the customary, not just as the characteristics of social groups, but as ways of seeing and feeling within a single mind. And then neither established language would serve to express this tension and disturbance. An educated style, as it had developed in a particular and exclusive group, was dumb in intensity and limited in humanity. The customary style, while carrying the voice of feeling, was still thwarted by ignorance and complacent in repetition and habit. Hardy veered between them, and the idiosyncrasy of his writing is related to this. So what Williams is, is effectively saying is that Hardy's writing is, is characterized by two styles. Now, whether or not we accept this as, as some final reading of, of, of Hardy's style, that's a, a different matter. But on Williams's reading, uh, the novel consists of two primary styles, the educated and, and the customary. Now, the educated style was necessary for observational and analytical exactitude, but it went hand in hand with a class with which Hardy shared no common sensibility and an education system overtly designed to set the superior class apart from other people. The customary style was one which, to put it simply, um, with which Hardy could feel but not think, at least not to the standards of sophistication which his novelistic art required. The writer moving through this history, writes Williams, had to explore, as if on his own, the resources of what seemed to be but was not, in fact, a common language. So this disturbance in Hardy's style is part of what Williams calls a general crisis of the relation between education and class. By refusing to sacrifice the advantages of either idiom, Hardy's style is characterized by an agonized effort to mediate the two ways of seeing and feeling, that of the alienated intellectual and of the vital but comparatively inarticulate rural working class. So the second connection then between crisis and culture in Williams's work is his alertness to what we might call these linguistic formalizations of crisis. Right, these linguistic formalizations of crisis. And I'll now move on to the final brief example, what he has to say about, in his later writings about Welsh national culture. These ideas come mainly from, from the late text, The Culture of Nations, which is included in Towards 2000, and the essay Wales and England. And both of these are included in, in Daniel Williams's excellent edited volume, uh, Who Speaks for Wales, and I'd really recommend Daniel's. Uh, introduction to that volume. It's, it's a fantastic piece of writing that sets the record straight on, on various things. In these writings, Williams opposes um, a reductive state-backed uh, selective tradition of patriotism by emphasizing the millennia-long history of the British Isles in all its true complexity. What he calls, and I quote, a long process of successive conquests and repressions, but also a successive supersessions and relative integrations. In doing so, he seeks to reinstate the real historical complexities of mobility, ethnicity, and the long sequence of historical rulers and victims. His real opponent here is the contemporary British state, and by extension, those who mistake the state for the real identity, or what he calls the projections for the people. Now, in his view, it was the integration of Wales into Britain's imperial economy that generated both resistance from the Merthyr Rising to the Rebecca Riots and three successive and overlapping modes of incorporation. The ideology of empire, with the Welsh becoming what he calls avid contributors to the British imperial project. Secondly, the ideology and organization of liberalism, 
And thirdly, the ideology and organization of laborism. So these are all modes of incorporation. Now within and against these modes of incorporation into British hegemony, Welsh social identity has on Williams's um, reasoning tended to go one of two ways. And you know, Wales is, Wales is definitely not alone in this. This is kind of repeated across many kind of national cultures. The first way is to a residual nationalism that asserted what he called a received traditional and unproblematic identity. Or in the other direction, to what he calls a pseudo-modernist rejection of the specificities of Welshness. And this incidentally is an extension of, of his critique of, of liberalism and modernism that he was writing at, at a similar time. So what was Williams's alternative, either to this kind of, this idea of an unproblematic, pristinely received traditional Welshness versus, um, you know, the, the kind of modern liberal um, conception, which is, uh, which kind of rejects specificity in the name of, of an abstract cosmopolitanism that is easily incorporated into kind of transnational capital networks. Well, Williams's own preference was, unsurprisingly, for what he calls the painful recognition of real dislocations, discontinuities, and problematic identities embodied in an emergent, and this is his phrase, anti-nationalist nationalism opposed to a centralized state. So Williams thus extended an emphasis on discontinuity that had characterized all of his major work to date by insisting on locating the core of Welsh culture in what he called the complex of forced and acquired discontinuities of certain autonomies hard won within a subordination. And in a crucial argument, he directly counterposes the actuality of Welsh cultural dislocation to what he calls the version of cultural nationalism in which the continuity and inner essence of a people is discovered in a selective version of its national literature in which he sees as itself one of the strongest and least noticed English influences on Welsh thought. And this is important because what Williams is effectively arguing here is that continuity and essence are not only to be rejected, but are actually seen to be the very ideological modality of English hegemony itself. Right? So to claim that there is some kind of unproblematic um, inheritable, pristine, long tradition of Welshness, this, this continuous tradition with no discontinuities. To make that claim is to adopt the modality of English hegemony itself. What Williams proposes instead is that Welsh national culture must thus tarry with the negative of sustained dislocations and defeats if it is not to reproduce the simplified form of English rule. So taken together, we've looked at these three examples of, of crisis and culture in Williams's work. And as I've said, they're not the only ones, but they're three kind of archetypal examples. And we have the following connections. In the first example, crisis is read as something like the experiential precondition for a critical materialist account of culture. Culture can only be thought by way of breaks and fissures. And I've tried to suggest that there is at least a formal similarity between that and the Althusserian tradition. Secondly, Williams is drawn to linguistic formalizations of crisis, both personal and social, and these linguistic formalizations constitute the core of the Williams canon. And thirdly, Welsh national culture, um, implicitly um, in his argument, must work through the crises and discontinuities of historical defeats as a mode of contemporary resistance. Now in each instance, crisis and discontinuity are felt to be painful. So there's an emphasis in, in, in that example in the writings on Wales of this painful recognition. Crisis and discontinuity are felt to be painful and this pain and the disturbances it causes are I think coextensive with the presence of the historical real for Williams. That is to say that for Williams, as for Frederick Jameson, history is what hurts. If Thorpe fails to channel and mediate this lived pain of social contradictions, 
then it risks falling prey to the irenic organicist continuities of idealism, whether they be the irenic organicist continuities of, of Elevis' great tradition, of, of an Eliotic um, Eurocentric order, or of the hegemony of the British state. So that's the main emphasis of, of crisis and culture, I think, in, in Williams and what it's doing. But how does this then play out at the level of method? What I think happens here is that Williams effectively transposes these insights on the relationship between crisis and culture into a method. That is to say that his method attempts to systematize these insights. It offers something like a protocol for historical materialist critique born of the painful dislocations of William's own experience. And it involves a historical materialist twist on the widest definition of culture that he inherited from T.S. Eliot, the whole way of life. Now, when Williams describes the theory of culture in the long revolution as, and I quote, the study of relationships between elements in a whole way of life, we must understand the whole way of life here not as a pre, <clears throat> excuse me, not as a pre-given entity waiting to be revealed, but rather as the ongoing result of a process of struggle against the limited images and selective traditions of the social totality that we are offered. So in other words, what I'm suggesting is that whole way of life seems to hover between three connected meanings in Williams's work. And this is important for his method. The first meaning of whole way of life is that of an actually existing totality that is greater than the sum of its parts. And this, broadly speaking, is the meaning inherited from Eliot's notes uh, towards the definition of culture. The second meaning of whole way of life, I would argue, is a project of critique which determinately negates all ideological and partial definitions of the social totality. And I'll come to a couple of examples of that in a moment. The third, is uh, a guiding vision of a future more complex society. And I think that these three meanings constantly interact in the phrase whole way of life in Williams. And the final point incidentally about the future is, is crucial. As Williams writes in The Long Revolution in a passage that's reminiscent of the young Marxist theory of revolution. And I quote, the alternative society that is proposed must be in wider terms than those of its opponents, if it is to generate the full energies necessary for its creation. Socialists must appeal to and unify all those elements that the dominant social order systematically excludes. And they must do so because if they don't, then they will fail to inspire people with a more expansive social vision and risk incorporation within the limiting terms of the dominant order. And this will potentially be one of the the possible shortcomings of the concept of, of a Green New Deal, as, as we'll see later. So Williams's method involves taking ideologically dominant images, that, that's his word that he uses in, in The Long Revolution, images of society or hegemonic selective traditions, and then identifying the ways in which they simplify an actually existing complexity. So what Williams constantly does is try to show that actually no, there's, this, there's a far too simplistic conception of saying modernism or of Welsh culture or of the history of the novel. He takes the given selective tradition, shows that it's too much of a simplistic conception, that it's a reified version of history, and he tries to then reinstate the true historical complexity behind it. What I want to claim here is that complexity in this method is not only a core principle of Williams's work, but is something like the methodological guarantor that the breaks, discontinuities and ruptures located and experienced in the pain of crisis are registered by thought. So in other words, complexity is something like the, uh, the methodological equivalent or stand-in for the pain of crisis in, in Williams's work, to put it in, in kind of slightly abstract terms like that. In Politics and Letters, he describes what his strategy was in culture and society. And he says it was to try to recover the true complexity of the tradition it had confiscated. 
so that the appropriation could be seen for what it was. And he repeats this method in all aspects of his work. Key words, uh, as I've mentioned, the history of modernism, the concepts of the regional novel, the country and the city, the national history of Wales, and so on. In each case, he systematically deconstructs the reified positivity of the selective traditions, restoring the true complex and painful history of these ideas. And in that light, it is then highly significant that in Towards 2000, Williams applied this method to the Marxist category of the mode of production itself. I mean, he applied it to many different things in, in Towards 2000, but it's significant for us, I would argue, um, that he also applies it to a key Marxist category. He writes, for the abstraction of production is a specialized and eventually ideological version of what is really in question, which is the form of human social relationships within a physical world. So he's arguing that the notion of the mode of production is too reliant on the capitalist definition of production, which was an argument that he'd already made in a different form in Marxism and literature regarding the term productive forces. Williams prefers the term way of life. Thus, in, in a sense, he returns to Eliot's definition of culture, whole way of life, to broaden the scope of the Marxist conception of the social totality. And more importantly, to connect the traditional labor movement with the new social movements of peace, ecology, and feminism. Because these movements, he writes, and I quote, are active um, and substantial in almost every area of life except the economy. It is as if everything that was excluded by the economic dominance and specializations of the capitalist order has been grasped and worked on, end of quote. So Williams is, is attempting to connect the revolutionary movement to precisely those elements of society which the capitalist order excludes. And chief among those exclusions was ecology. Williams argues that the connection between the forces and the relations of production has to be restated. And he argues this across a range of texts in, in this period, socialism and ecology and, and, and others and, and elsewhere. Um, many of them collected in Resources of Hope. What has been steadily learned and imposed, he writes, is a way of seeing the world not as life forms um, and land forms in intricate interdependence, but as a range of opportunities for their profitable exploitation. And moreover, this orientation, he writes, to the world as raw material necessarily includes an attitude to people as raw material. Um, indeed, it even includes seeing one's self as raw material. What is thus required, he claims, is a new orientation of livelihood, of practical, self-managing, self-renewing societies in which people care first for each other in a living world. And it's at this point that he suggests replacing mode of production with way of life. And it's also by extension this point, at this point that the problematic of culture has in a sense come full circle from the cultivation of the land, as we saw in that initial uh, etymology of the word, to the supposedly rarefied heights of art and learning abstracted from the land, and now back to life forms and land forms in towards 2000. And this is the return of capitalist modernities, earthly, repressed. So what, what I've done there so far is, I've tried to suggest in, in, in the first part of the talk that there is an intrinsic connection between crisis and culture um, in Williams's thought. And I, I've given those three examples. In the second part, I've tried to suggest that uh, the, the findings of, of that connection or the experience of that connection between crisis and culture is transposed into his method, which is one of deconstructing the reified positivity of dominant social images or selective traditions and trying then to reinstate the true social and historical complexity that those selective traditions have erased. He then applies that method itself to the Marxist concept of mode of production arguing that the concept mode of production um, cedes too much ground to bourgeois capitalist logic um, and, is, and is a kind of uh, an unwitting prisoner to, to bourgeois ideology at the very heart of its own historical materialist theory. And I've then connected that at the end to the broad sweep of the historical trajectory 
of, of the keyword culture that we began with. What I want to close with in, in the final part of the talk now is to think about what the connection might be between what we've just looked at and contemporary debates over the Green New Deal and repeasantization. And I'll say at the outset that, that these remarks are much more speculative in nature than, than the previous two parts um, of the talk. Now, Williams's theory of culture can be seen to open out onto terrain now firmly under discussion in ongoing debates over the Green New Deal. And the first thing that I want to note is that I strongly suspect, and I'll be more than happy to discuss this in the Q&A, but I strongly suspect that Williams would have rejected any framing of the potential solution to the current crisis we face in terms of the Green New Deal. The concept of a New Deal, and here I'm going to perform a sort of a, a poor man's um, keywords analysis, right, a very, very brief one. The concept of, of a New Deal, I was surprised to learn recently, originated in Mark Twain's a Connecticut Yankee at King Arthur's court, where it's associated with a politically highly ambiguous and largely anti-democratic Yankee program of educating and reforming the oppressed. There's a great chapter in Stephen, Knight books on, uh, Stephen Knight's book on Arthurian literature that talks about this. The term was then later self-evidently taken up by Roosevelt's advisors during the Great Depression and harnessed to a program of mass state intervention. Um, and Jasper Burns' um, article in 2019 on the Green New Deal summarizes the New Deal quite nicely. I know that many of you will already be familiar with this. The New Deal was a response to an immediate economic emergency. Its main goal was to restore growth to an economy that had shrunk by 50% and in which one out of every four people was unemployed. The goal of the New Deal was to get capitalism to do what it already wanted to do, put people to work, exploit them, and then sell the products of their own labor. The state was necessary as a catalyst and a mediator, setting the right balance between profit and wages, chiefly by strengthening the hand of labor and weakening that of business. Whereas the New Deal needed only to restore growth, the Green New Deal has to generate growth and reduce emissions. So the, the larger arc of, of, of Burns's article is to try and contextualize the Green New Deal within the period of so-called secular stagnation. Um, the Green New Deal has to generate growth and reduce emissions. The problem is that growth and emissions are by almost every measure profoundly correlated. So given that this is the background to the term New Deal, the term Green New Deal comes with a certain set of historical and conceptual baggage. And as socialist proponents of the Green New Deal are not unaware, so you know, there's, I'm not claiming that this is anything particularly new, but as they're not unaware, there is a grave risk here of political incorporation. And perhaps even ultimately, um, there's a risk of a serious defeat of, of radical energies involved in backing the project of a Green New Deal. The wager seems to be that the battle for the future must now occur within the remit of the Green New Deal. And the risk is that these strategic justifications gradually fall prey to a kind of self-defeating real politic, which accommodates itself to the horizon of capital in return for just about any incremental improvement in terms of climate action. So, I, so I'm certainly not suggesting that politically, Williams wouldn't in some sense support some version of a Green New Deal under the right political conditions, right? So the argument I am making is that I suspect theoretically he would be profoundly opposed to conceiving of the solution to the climate crisis in terms of a Green New Deal, partly for that reason, but also partly because a focus on the Green New Deal serves to uh, erase or to conceal from view previous lines of thought about ecological crisis and previous political projects. And I think that what Williams would try to do as he did in his own work would be to try to reinstate those lines of resistance theory and action, which have now been concealed by view, from view by the relative hegemony that the Green New Deal vision increasingly holds over much um, ecological thought. So Max Ale, for example, um, uh, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing uh, his surname, in his excellent book, A People's Green New Deal, has reminded us that as recently as 2010, the Cochabamba People's Process set out a series of radical proposals centered around the concept of climate debt. 
representatives of the global south set out um, a project for the universal declaration on the rights of mother earth and for interlocking forms of restitution that would serve to break the global north's grip over the south at the same time as laying the groundwork for a substantial ecological revolution. At the time, it was hailed by Naomi Klein as, and I quote, the most radical and transformative vision so far. But since then, this entire historical trajectory of global struggle from the 1990s to the early 2000s now risks becoming the victim of a certain type of Green New Deal amnesia. And in the process, it limits our possible conception of alternative framings and alternative futures. And this is just one, I imagine, of many examples. So what, what I'm trying to suggest here is I'm trying to suggest the, the, the way in which I think Williams would try to go about conceptualizing current contemporary problems and perform a critique of the now relatively hegemonic term Green New Deal in terms of thinking ecological issues. So that's the first point. Now there is one point, or, or there's a second point within conceptions of the Green New Deal, though one that is largely underrepresented, and that is to do with the phenomenon of repeasantization which is not historically new, it's occurred predominantly in the period of, of neoliberalism for various reasons across the world, but is one that is increasingly coming to the fore in terms of debates connected to the Green New Deal. So what is meant by this? Well, de-peasantization is often seen as definitive of modernity. The peasant supposedly belongs to a pre-modern past that is overcome in the course of modern capitalist development. So the peasant, in terms of the, the usual ideology of modernization, the peasant is destined to be, to become a thing of the past. It's almost a, a if it still exists, it's a living anachronism. And yet contemporary re-peasantization movements, for example, La Via Campesina or the Brazilian uh, landless workers movement, just to name two of the, the, the best known um, organizations, they challenge this, this view of history consisting of a whole range of variations and extents depending upon the particular dynamics of the local context. The common factors of re-peasantization movements include a return to peasant modes of small-scale agriculture, a rejection of capitalist large-scale industrial agriculture, a fight for food sovereignty and land, and a process of establishing a new and sustainable equilibrium between the country and the city. And ecologically, in terms of climate change, it will be crucial Peasant agriculture serves via agroecology to reduce soil erosion, enabling much greater CO2 absorption. It increases food quality. It reduces the risk of zoonotic diseases, um, disease viruses like COVID, and it relocalizes food production, which thereby limits the vast global commodity circuits that currently rule uh, international food distribution systems. Now, I'm not gonna to pretend to be um, an authority on these issues. So have, I've worked on Williams for quite a while now, but I've only recently tried to connect Williams's work on culture to these more contemporary debates. But what I can say is that even the most cursory familiarity with the secondary literature on repeasantization suggests that what we are witnessing here is in many ways the next historical stage in the socio-ecological trajectory of the key word culture. And what I mean here can effectively be mapped onto the three elements of crisis and culture that we looked at earlier. And we can call these broadly, the Levis problem, the Hardy problem, and the national problem. So let's take the Levis problem first. In the so-called Levis problem, which is that of the, uh, the continuing uh, appeal of the vision of the organic community, this now has to be recast in a global age in which the so-called agrarian question is now back on the agenda, albeit this is sometimes denied even by classical Marxists themselves who reduce the agrarian question to the capitalist overhaul and industrialization of agriculture. So what is the connection between repeasantization and the Leibniz problem? First of all, it reminds us that within the Marxist tradition, there is something that, that I would describe as an almost pathological self-defense against all forms of rural nostalgia. Almost one of the worst things that you can do theoretically as a Marxist when conceiving of any kind of alternative society is indulge in rural nostalgia. It's, it, it, it's an unwritten rule um, of the Marxist tradition. 
Now, the problem here is that in practice, this necessary um, obsession can become a form of the very urban superciliousness that is coextensive with the hegemonic capitalist imaginary of the modern. So on this view, to speak of present day peasants can only ever be an anachronism, which is why the literature on repeasantization has to almost obsessively insist upon the contemporaneity of the peasant. So if you look at any of the key secondary literature on repeasantization movements um, in critical agrarian studies, I guarantee it will have some mention somewhere that the peasant is a contemporary figure. It is a truly contemporary subject of the contemporary moment. So there is a real kind of um, emphasis on, on historical temporality in, in these debates. Now, what I want to suggest is that Williams's work clearly offers certain ways that we can think this, but it also offers certain problems. So what are the problems that it might um, offer Williams's thought? The first is related to his totally understandable desire to stress the early capitalization of English agriculture in the country and the city, where he consistently stresses the historically early demise of the peasantry in England. And he writes off effectively every subsequent usage of, of peasant as a descriptor. Um, and he writes this off to the condescension of the urban bourgeoisie. In other words, every use of, of, of the peasant is just the urban bourgeoisie having no true historical understanding of capitalist agriculture and it's a kind of a projection so there is a williams in a certain sense embodies this desire within the marxist tradition not to indulge in rural nostalgia and to have a kind of a clear vision about the capitalization of of agriculture in in england so there is a sense that there might be a certain reluctance to conceive of the, the present in terms of the figure of the peasantry, precisely because of that, that type of historical logic. And yet, if we, if we draw on Williams's um, alternative terminology, we could say that repeasantization const constitutes a progressive alliance between the residual and the emergent. In fact, it is, it is emergence in the guise of the residual in many ways. It looks like something that is pre-modern, but is in actual fact completely contemporary. And this means that we might have to reconfigure our utopian imaginaries to wean them off both urban-based hyper-modern city worlds and inadequate rural nostalgias. And just to show that in the secondary literature itself, this is, this is recognized. There's a quote here from a book on the Via Campesina. It is important to stress that the peasant model advocated by the Via Campesina does not entail a complete rejection of modernity, technology, and trade, accompanied by a romanticized return to an archaic past steeped in rustic traditions. Rather, the Via Campesina insists that an alternative model must be based on certain ethics and values where culture and justice count for something and concrete mechanisms are put in place to ensure a future without hunger. So we can see here a continuation of the issues that were involved with the Levis problem, but they're now assuming different forms. And Williams's work at once offers possibilities for, for thinking them and conceiving of the cultural logic of these debates, but it also requires certain internal adjustments of its own. The second problem was the Hardy problem. And the connection to repeasantization here is that the latter constitutes a new configuration of intellectuality. To put this simply, perhaps too simply, one might argue that the most important radical and life-changing ideas in the world today are not being learned and taught in universities and certainly not in universities in the global north, but by, among, and for contemporary peasants, primarily in the so-called global south. So there is um, a much documented uh, peasant pedagogy that is integral to repeasantization movements there's a sense that there are collectives of organic intellectuals that are forming that offer something like um, a particular solution to the Hardy problem of the crisis of class and education. Right? It's a kind of a Gramscian solution to that problem. But I want to just give you an idea of what this means by, by quoting this uh, recent study. Rural social movements are actively creating these agroecological edu educational processes 
La Via Campesina, its regional secretariats and its member organizations have created peasant schools and educational processes based on agroecology in Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. These schools and processes reveal a great diversity, ranging from formal school education that runs from secondary school through higher education, as well as peasant trainings and peasant to peasant schools without walls. So as I say, we're dealing here with the construction of an international network of organic intellectuals who combine modern scientific and indigenous knowledge. And they, in a certain sense, embody a way beyond the impasses of class and education sketched out by Williams. And the third and final aspect then is the so-called national problem. And the basic idea here, which has been put forward by various scholars in critical agrarian studies, is that the so-called new agrarian question also leads to a new national question. That food sovereignty struggles cannot be separated from national sovereignty struggles in the global south. And I'll just look at this quotation. We submit that the agrarian question of anti-colonial liberation remains at the heart of the contemporary agrarian question. For its fate will continue to have preponderant influence over the fate of gender relations, ecology, or regionalism. But differently, neither gender equity nor ecological sustainability nor autonomous regional integration can be expected to progress under the tutelage of monopoly capitalism. It is this which justifies our own exclamation, long live the agrarian question. So what I've tried to suggest here then in this kind of speculative conclusion is that Williams's method offers certain ways of posing critical questions to the now a dominant conception of, of the Green New Deal within debates on, on climate change. And I've suggested that this certainly doesn't entail a political rejection of it necessarily, but it might entail a theoretical rejection of the concept of a Green New Deal. And I've then suggested that contemporary repeasantization struggles offer the next stage in that socio-ecological trajectory of the keyword culture that William spent much of his life writing about um, and, and, and living the contradictions uh, of that trajectory himself. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan. That was, um, that was really fascinating. And um, I feel like a huge amount of ground <laughs> was covered and a huge amount of new ground broken. So I'm going to ask whether anybody has any questions. Um, you can put them in the chat or you can turn your mic on. Who would like to ask a question to Dan? Well, I haven't really got a question. I have got a request, uh, which was, could you, um, I was very interested in what you were saying about representation, and it's not something I know very much about. So could you suggest some reading, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, sure. So it's funny you should say that. So <laughs> this looks rehearsed, doesn't it? It's literally like, can you have some reading? Oh, yeah, I just yeah. <laughs> the book right next to me. I swear to God, this isn't rehearsed. But this book, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say why. It's called yeah. the, New, the New Peasantries, Rural Development in Times of Globalization, mm -hmm. uh, written by a scholar called uh, I, it's a Dutch scholar, uh, forgive me if I'm butchering this name, Jan Dover van der Ploeg. So P-L-O-E-G is, is the surname, van der Ploeg, um, called the New Peasantries. Mm. The reason why I suggest that, I mean, there are, there are loads, um, but the reason why I suggest that book in particular in terms of one that has spoken to me um, about these issues is my sense is that there, there is a, a fundamental kind of democratic theoretically very astute, very careful approach that he adopts in this book that reminds me of reading Williams. There are, there's a real sensitivity to why people across the world are, are drawn to or drawn back to peasant agriculture as a way of um, winning autonomy for themselves, uh, as a way of helping the climate for various different reasons. There's a real sensitivity to it and a real kind of nuance and, and historical materialist sophistication. And yet, um, van, van der Ploeg is often um, referred to kind of um, disparagingly as a populist, a sort of a new populist, mm. in the sense of 
the the broader longer trajectory of the tradition of, of the populace from the Narodniks um, onward um, and, and, and Chayanov uh, as well um, uh, at the time of the, uh, of the Russian Revolution and of course you know for Williams you know Williams has also at various times been written off as populist but then in um, notes what's what's the uh, What's it called? Notes on British Marxism since 1945. Is that the title? I forget it. Uh, I think it's English Marxism. English Marxism. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Notes on English Marxism since 1945. Um, that's the article in which she goes through kind of word by word uh, all of the accusations that Eagleton and Stuart Hall made against him, including uh, romantic, populist, reformist, and so on. Uh, and it's very interesting to to see what he has to say there about about the accusation of populism. And I suspect that that someone like Van der Plug would would make a similar argument. Mm. That's fascinating. I suppose that the, the one of the questions then would be the role of sovereignty. I suppose in both in, in representation and, and thinking yeah. about because it's often tied up with things like food sovereignty, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and that kind of larger question about the the relationship between populism and sovereignty. Do you see that as something that's quite important for the work that you're doing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the question of food sovereignty is is, is absolutely crucial and, and is bound up with this. The attempt to um, to win independence uh, from the kind of international capitalist food production system. Mm. Um, there's a massive kind of emphasis on that uh, in in the secondary literature, um, and. It goes hand in hand, uh, I think, for, for the scholars that I was that I was saying uh, at the end there in particular, with a conception of, of national self-determination. Mm. Um, and this is crucial because uh, one of the, you know, one of the shortcomings of many of the, uh, the Green New Deals, uh, when, when you look at the detail, is that there is very little attention to the Global South and the relationship between the Global North and the Global South. Um, so this emphasis on the connection between food sovereignty and national sovereignty is key. Of course, you know, uh, the secondary literature on this is far from naive. It doesn't presuppose that, um, you know, an international peasant network alone is capable of, of, uh, of achieving this beyond a wider transformation of social relations. So it's always an, it seems to always be an autonomy that is one within a broader dominance of, of, of capital, continued dominance of capital. So there's a sense in which to, to really come into its own um, for, the, for, the, for the riches of representation to be truly socialized would involve a broader, large scale confrontation with capital. Mm -hmm. Eleanor, David, thank you very much for this Hi, evening's Nick. lecture. It's been absolutely fantastic. Oh, thanks. Uh, I've, I've been really mind expanding. Oh, thanks, Nick. That's uh, really it kind does of remind me, however, of that old cliche. You know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And I was thinking, I mean, I've firstly, as an old fart, I've come to reread re -re 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 Williams again in the last couple of years. Because uh, I really, in a, in a rush, uh, when I read Town and the City and that when I was young, mm. uh, and I found in, 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 his, in, uh, in his thinking a, 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 a much greater depth than I originally realised was in there. And I think you, Daniel, have, have articulated by the, your archaeology of his texts, by, have, have articulated that. <clears throat> and I, and I, I also love the stuff he wrote about um, as, a, as a sort of black country bloke who comes from an industrial background. Mm. Perversely, I'm a great fan of, of Thomas Hardy because yeah. he doesn't romanticise rural life. Yeah. It's not romantic. You know, it's yeah. horrible. It's tough. People die. They're exploited. Uh, it, it's not romantic in any sense. And I think that what, what I've realized with Williams as well, he's got a different sense of time to most writers. Mm. Uh, his idea of time is like uh, hundreds of years, not, not, yeah. not uh, short intervals. And I think that that perception of, I think one of the problems of modern society <clears throat> is we've lost our sense of geography. 
mm. and our sense of time. Yeah. We're dislocated in time because we live in this 24 hour news cycle thing in a permanent present. And we're dislocated in geography because you go to the shop and you can have strawberries all the time. The yeah. only thing that's changed is the distance they've traveled. Yeah. But you don't have to travel. You just go and get them. So I think those dislocations uh, mean it's very difficult for us to imagine a world without those um, economic uh, infrastructure, that, that shape uh, of how we would live. Uh, and I must admit, when you got to the end, I wasn't expecting to end up there, by the way. Uh, no. The journey that you've taken me on tonight wasn't, and I think Eleanor and many of the participants probably uh, have had the same experience. We've ended up somewhere we didn't expect to end up. <laughs> and I think that's great. And it reminds me of John Berger's work, obviously. But also William Morris, you know, uh, you've taken us on a news from nowhere journey uh, in a contemporary setting, which I just think has been wonderful. So I, I've really, I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed it. I've gone online to Backwells and ordered your book about oh, style yeah. because you've, you've whetted my appetite. Uh, and and as, a as, as a recently retired academic, uh, it's fantastic. The language you've used tonight has just been beautiful. It's been great. I've you've really stretched me. You've made me think a lot, and it, you've set so many hairs running in my head. Uh, I, I, you know, to find a single question to ask you is very difficult because it's such a uh, it's such a fantastic kaleidoscope of ideas that you've thrown out together. And why I thought I'd chip in when it went very quiet. It's because I think I'm, I'm probably not alone in feeling this. Uh, I need to go away now and think about what you've said, because I think you've made a really profound uh, contribution. And uh, uh, you know, like, again, fact, the society for generating these amazing uh, talks over the, you know, to celebrate the, the life of, of Raymond. Uh, I really appreciate it. So, so Daniel, thank you very, very much. My, my question is, is, I suppose, I, I've just I went to because I'm a sado. I went to Brecon, uh, you know, got, went from Eriford to Aberystwyth on the bus and did that stuff. Mm. And I, I started reading The People of the Black Mountains. Mm. So I'd, I'd started to read it, you know, 20 years ago and never finished it because I thought, well, you know, he hasn't finished writing it yet, but of course he never did. But I, I was, uh, I think that sense of time and yeah. that sense of the, uh, I don't think we've, we've got the, we don't, I don't think we realize how temporary the space in which we are currently living is. Uh, and I think Williams was very good at that. And I think, you, and, and that point about crisis and identifying that the present is temporary. And when we, we, we think it's quite solid and strong and permanent, and in reality, it isn't. I think he, he highlighted that absolutely brilliantly. And I think you've reminded me of that this evening. So thank you very much for that. Oh, thanks, thanks, Nick. That's, that's, that's really kind of you. I really appreciate that. That means a lot. Um, I, I'd just like to kind of respond to a couple of things that you said to kind of echo things that you've said. So one was your, your experience of sort of going back to Williams and, and rereading text that you'd read earlier. And I think that there is something about that. There is a kind of a richness to, to Williams's work that it's, it's kind of, a, I mean, it's a cliche, but it really is a gift that keeps on giving. I mean, something that you go back to, I found that, you know, the more kind of temporary defeats that you clock up in life, <laughs> The more that you can relate to those moments of pain and crisis and defeat in in, in Williams's work, and then on on time, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, there's that famous passage at the start of towards 2000, um, where you know he talks about the different types of calendar times, and there's almost a sense in which you know even the, the way that the calendar works for him is broadly provincial because his senses of millennia and millennia, um, and again that you know that as you said that comes out in People of the Black Mountains. And there's also there's also a, a kind of a funnier element to that. There's that story he tells in uh, politics and letters where um, the fact that he wasn't in awe at all when he went to Cambridge because he was used to the long historical sweep, and then uh, when someone at Cambridge, you yeah. know, was was boasting to him, "Oh, my family came across with the Normans," and to which Williams would respond, "Oh, really? And how are you finding it here?" <laughs> so it's. There's that, there's that sense of the confidence yeah. in the long, broad sweep of, of history. And as a working class oik, uh, Daniel, um, who's got, who uh, went into our education later, probably, uh, I always, when I go to places like Oxford and Cambridge, 
you get through these. Um, it's quite, it's a complex set of emotions. It's a mm. mixture of jealousy because you never had the kind of resources that these people have got. It's a slight bit of envy because you would quite like to have it. And then there's this terrible resentment. You know, this mm. sort of, um, I suppose it's a sort of class hatred in a way. Mm. That it's, uh, it's bastards. It's got all this stuff, you know. But then also, if you've got that self-confidence that he had of who's, who he was and where he was from. Um, shall I answer the, the question? Yeah, I was, um, I was just going to say it's really, and actually there has something in common with what you were saying before about periodization, I think. So, so the, the question in the chat um, from Mao, and I apologize if I've mispronounced your name, is that uh, one of the more common indigenous critiques of capitalism, which makes itself legible to Marxism, is centered around the concept of extractivism, which to me has a sometimes contradictory relation, relation to crisis. The whole period from colonization to the present stands as a continuous crisis of extractivism, which feels quite different from the tidier periodization to European modernity. Um, can you think of Williams uh, or Williams of extractivism in a similar way to the Williams of crisis? Or just tell us other concepts which for Willi Williams perform a similar work to crisis? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a brilliant question very difficult to answer um a couple of things that, that that come to mind in in terms of extractivism i recently read the um the book by um is it martin Ar arboledo I, I, forgive me for mispronouncing his game i think it's called planetary mind published by Burso. Um, and what's interesting is that that's an entire book about extractivism and the international commodity chains that are involved in extractivism but also the different types of, uh, of resistance to it. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and one of the, the, the key figures of resistance in that book is precisely uh, indigenous peasant resistance to these practices. And in fact, he goes into detail quoting um, Bastilles and um, Garcia Linera, the, the, the Bolivian Marxist theorist who entered government with Morales. Um, he goes into detail about the strange temporality of, uh, of, the, of the peasant resistance in a way to what I described earlier, this, this curious mixture of the residual and the emergent and the way that we have to shift that conception of historical temporality in order to conceive of it. More literally, in Williams's uh, Rivers, the, the essay, Eleanor, help me out, what's the exact title of the essay on the industrial, the Welsh industrial novel? Is, is that what it is the, on the Welsh industrial novel? Is that the it's just called the Welsh industrial novel? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So the Welsh industrial novel um, offers a kind of a fascinating history of effectively the 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 history of mining, the way in which Wales itself historically underwent this process of uh, internal disarticulation, where Wales's internal economy was gradually organized to suit the external needs of, of the British Empire. Uh, uh, so it was kind of dependent on that economy and all of the types of effects that that had on literary form in the Welsh industrial novel. Um, so it doesn't go very far to answering, you know, can you think of audience of extractivism? But I think that the elements of an answer to that question would lie in that text. So forgive me if, if, if that's um, an inadequate answer. Um, and then is there another one? Yeah, there's one qu there's a question from uh, Rosemary Walters. Um, I wondered if the concept of liberation fits in with the three conclusions from what to what. I was reminded of liberation theology, which attempts to reconstruct Christian theology in terms of the oppressed and the oppressors, originally in a rural economic context, and includes liberation form ideas which restrict justice. Um, Gutierrez might have something to say here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I don't know that much about liberation theology, to be honest, other than um, Terry Eagleton's brief forays in that direction in his in his early work um, and, and in the journal Slant. But I don't know enough about it to be able to comment. But I think liberation is is definitely um, a concept that crops up constantly. You know, the the, the history of uh, of national liberation movements, um, as I say, are tied. Uh, to the concept of uh, food sovereignty, to the concept of the agrarian question in much of the secondary literature. And liberation is, is mentioned just as much as autonomy as being one of the, the key terms of debate. <laughs> I see your, your cat in the background, Eleanor. Um, yeah, so that, that's all I have to say, but that's something that I'll make a note of 
to think about what the connection might be here. Um, and incidentally, Rosemary, if, if you if if you know any any more about that, do feel free to turn on your mic and, and tell us something about that. Uh, well, I, it just occurred to me that that so much of what you were saying seemed to have a resonance with South America, right? Um, yeah, and, and the liberation theology movement there. And I'm thinking of Archbishop Romero. Yeah. Um, you know, and his martyrdom, and um, I wondered how you felt Williams might approach the idea of combining the ethics of, of Christianity in the, uh, as construed in liberation theology with Marxist ideas in order to bring about this liberation. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a big question. I mean, I think that from my reading of Williams, I would I would class him as broadly skeptical when it comes to anything to do with theology insofar as it's institutionalized. But of course, liberation theology is a different kettle of fish entirely. So it's difficult to say. What what you could say is that um we could look at an example of, of what happens in, in practice to a conception of Marxism when it tries to accommodate a certain type of radical theology, and that would be someone like Terry Eagleton. Um, and what you end up with there is a strange compromise um, between uh, an attempt at a sort of ruthless uh, historical materialist critique combined with a sense because of the the focus on the the mutilated political prisoner of, of Jesus Christ, there's a sense that uh, salvation has always already been achieved. So it, there's a very curious um, tension between the desire for liberation and the sense that one is always already saved. Oh. Uh, if one has faith and yeah. there's there's a curious tension that opens up there in, in Eagleton's work that has direct effects for the way that he reads text for it for his own writing um, and I wonder if that might give us pointers for for, for... yes thank you very helpful but, but thanks Rosemary I appreciate that well, we're coming up to sort of half seven now which is when we sort of thought we'd probably yeah. end. Um, if anybody else does have a question, perhaps they could just either raise their hand using the reactions button. We've got time for perhaps one more. Or put something in the chat. So Phil says, uh, during one of the Swansea events of Williams' centenary, Maria Eliza Cavasco told a story of how she translated for and taught culture as ordinary to the landless workers movement in Brazil. So we have a direct link between w Williams and contemporary representation struggles too. How do you think Williams on culture specifically might be useful for such struggles? Oh, that's a great question. Also, it's great to know that Maria Elisa Chavasco did that. I mean, that's brilliant. I had no idea. And incidentally, Maria Elisa Chavasco will be contributing to the special issue on Raymond Williams and world literature um, that's coming out with keywords next year that, that I'm editing. So that's brilliant. I think it's more that what it allows you to do is uh, it allows you to, to conceive of those struggles as part of a, a longer history of, of modernity. I mean, this isn't, you know, it's not news to the to the to those involved in representation struggles themselves. It's more more pertinent, I think, perhaps for intellectuals in the global north trying to understand what is going on with them. I think that it helps us to make connections. You know, this is one of Williams's constant refrains: making connections. But it helps us to make connections between these contemporary struggles and the broader socio-ecological trajectory that is contained in the word culture itself. And, and to see oneself uh, as an active participant in the contradictions contained in the keyword culture, and potentially as someone who can contribute to an actual socio-ecological resolution of some of those contradictions. So I would put it like that, perhaps that's a little bit too abstract, but that's how I would personally conceive of it. But thanks for the question, Phil. Okay, so I think if there's no 
further questions. I'm sure you'll um, all join me in thanking Daniel for a really uh, mind expanding uh, lecture and, and also for fantastic responses to questions. And thank you to everybody who asked a question as well. Um, just to remind you that we have one more event in this series, which is coming up on Wednesday, the 17th of November, also at 6 p.m., which is a roundtable discussion of a book, uh, Raymond Williams at 100, which Daniel is, is also a contributor to, I think, um, with Anna Cornblue, Maddie Krishnan and Paul Stacey. Um, once again, you can join, the, the Google link will be on, uh, is actually already on the Raymond Williams Society website, that's raymondwilliams.co.uk. So we'll see many of you there, hopefully. So thanks again, Dan, and thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming and thanks for the great questions. I really appreciate it, thank you.